Some worms. Here you go. Go and give them some worms for the chickens. Hmm. Well, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, if you're watching from um, the east coast of America. Welcome back, or welcome for the first time. Um, it's lovely to see you all. Thank you so much for joining us on this live stream event to celebrate the launch of my book. Featherhood, which is out today. Yay! Hooray. And um, thank you everyone here for joining us, both human and avian. Uh, I'm very pleased that you could all come. Aww. Egg coffee. There you go, chook chooks. Come on, here chook chooks. Um, so we were doing these sort of live, live streams during lockdown, and then Lockdown finished and, and we also stopped doing those live streams, but we're back. Um, it's lovely to be back. How does everyone feel about being back? Perfect. Charmed. <laughs> and we've also got a new set built by uh, Yanina. Yay! Yanina, will you tell us about the set? Uh, it's the Red Room from Queen Peaks, which oh. is kind of the... That's going to be really cool. Queen Peaks. <laughs> a linker. Um, which is sort of the ultimate virtual reality room, as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah. so twin beaks then. Yeah. Twin beaks. Mm, great. What's going on with the worms, Charlie? Um, egg dog is being no, 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 <laughs> quiet. No, that's enough. I didn't get that's enough. <laughs> egg dog, be quiet. Don't worry. Excuse with us children. for just a minute. Our host and matron G is. <laughs> Busy wrangling with some avian chickens. wrangling <laughs> chickens. A problem he didn't quite think through. <laughs> 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 well, careful where you tread. Are there worms? Oh. Yeah. Oh. Just don't let a Linka have the worm. Come on. Okay. Oh, come on. So, um, tread, I seem to have gone a bit sideways. So we're going to have some words. We've got some birds. We're going to have some songs. Um, maybe I should say a bit about what the book is about. Yeah, I don't do that. Um, <clears throat> Anything to take your, my mind off these words. Yeah. <laughs> so the book is a is a is a mem the book is a memoir, um, and it's 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 bird themed, as you might have guessed, and it's about. It begins uh, with this magpie that fell out of its nest uh, in a junkyard in in southeast London, and Yanina brought it home, and. Um, these chickens are just chaos. Yanina <laughs> <laughs> uh, brought it home, and I, and I was sort of quite ignorant about um, magpies, which are members of the crow family at this point, so I, I didn't realise when this magpie came home that it was going to become part of the family. And, 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 and as a member of the crow family, you know, they're highly, highly intelligent birds with these enormous personalities. Um, and it became part of sort of all of our family, really. We sort of raised this chick... And, and let it fly free, and it didn't fly away, it just wanted to stay, um, and, and got up to all sorts of um, adventures uh, and mischief. Uh, and everyone here, except maybe Romany, didn't have such a good relationship I with I loved her for the first two years, and then she went through puberty and became a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
She had opinions, mm. Benzine. Oh, and and we called her Benzine. The, the magpie is called Benzine um, because her feathers had this sort of beautiful petrochemical sheen. Yeah. And I still miss her, weirdly. Yeah. Um, but actually, Olympus pretty fair substitute. Yeah. Um, so the book sort of begins with this, this orphaned bird arriving. Um, and when it... Uh, arrived while caring for it I discovered that uh, my biological father who is this uh, somewhat eccentric poet and magician who, who vanished in the dead of night when I was a baby also had this intense bond with another member of the crow family a jackdaw just before I was born and so it's sort of an interweaving of of those two stories of me and this magpie and him and this jackdaw but it's also about you know what it's like to have two fathers, one a very, very present adoptive father, and then this very absent, quite difficult uh, biological father, um, and the differences in those sorts of relationships, and what it means to, to care and be a father, really. Um, and it's a very intensely personal book. I mean, you Which say that you weren't <laughs> worried about me writing this book, but th there must have been moments. Well, I think um, I was more surprised um, that you that you would write this book because um, I've always thought of you as a very secretive person, mm. and um, you know, a, a, probably a, a, a everyone I know, I've never known anyone sort of keep their thoughts to themselves quite like you have through your life, and so the idea that you would write a memoir is quite at odds with the person I know. Mm. Papa, were you nervous that it was actually just going to be a sort of uh, trashy tell-all? Oh, I was worried about how badly you'd treat me, but uh, <laughs> it turned out that I shouldn't have really worried. <laughs> I mean, you, so, come, you come off rather well, because, you know, yeah. you, you, you behave rather well in life. Mostly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a fantastic book. Um, I've listened to it very carefully the whole way through, because Charlie's read it to me. We uh, recorded the audio book a few weeks ago, and I was the engineer doing that. Luckily, I didn't have to do the editing. But um, the audio book is also out, I guess, quite soon. And that's... But that's cool, careful where you tread. <laughs> There's a huge chicken poop. Baba. Um, yeah. Baba. Um, yeah. Yeah. There we how, how did you find recording the audio book? Um, well, we'd done Polly's one a little bit earlier, and I'd learned some stuff. It's a very, very different thing to what I'm used to. Mm. Um, with Polly's one, I did the editing as well, and that nearly finished me off. It's, it's, a, it's an enormous amount of work. But, um, no, it's, we, we found a better space to do it, and yeah. as well as it the sounds sort of fantastic, the, the, and it's very, very well read. As well as the technical side of things, were there bits that you found emotionally difficult? Yes. There were um, strange moments when, you know, I had to hold back a dab of moisture in my eye. You know. <laughs> And Yanina, what about you? I mean, you're in the book. You're Yana. I had to. Do, uh, Yanina's name is also Yana. That's the sort of Slavic diminutive of Yanina. But I had to change your name just because I found it too difficult to write about you. I think it is just very, very difficult to put someone on paper who you live with. Live with, yeah, and see every single day in, in so yeah. many different ways. I mean, I guess we, we do create sort of narratives and when you know that this narrative will actually go out to loads of people, you sort of have to do something, I think, to put um, some sort of container between your real life and the thing that you write about. Mm. Oh, you're cleaning up the poo, <laughs> cleaning up the chicken that poo. That is his role. Yeah. We've spoken about the poo spatula. <laughs> um, Romany, what did you think about the way that you were portrayed in the book? Um, there were uh, probably quite a lot of bratty moments you could have chosen from about my sort of 13-year-old self, so I was quite relieved at your mercy that I was basically <laughs> just the little sister with the hairy large ball of a cat. Yeah, because I have been... I mean, this is something that I've been writing since 2017. And in a way, it, it feels like you sort of have an awesome power while you're writing a memoir, because you can Be hold nice that as a me. exactly you can <laughs> hold this as a threat, and everyone has to behave. Sorry, aeroplane going over here. Everyone has to behave quite well around you. Do you, did that impact anything that anyone said or did? Uh, um. Well, 
I call you... I, I, I call you names I, I didn't before. That's true, but now that the memoir's finished. Now that the memoir's finished, maybe that's what it is. <laughs> I have... Oopsie! Linka, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, you've got Bear Bear, that's good. That's very good. And Spray awesome. Can. <laughs> How are we doing for the for time? Let's just have a look what's going Lincoln, on. Linka, get the chickens. Let's not Thank do the again. chickens again. They're not behaving well. Uh, people are asking about uh, the, why, the, why we're in a Twin Peaks set. Someone had a joke about this. What was the joke? Because it's a book about two birds. So oh, it's, it's Twin Beaks. It's Twin Beaks. It's, yeah. yeah, it's close, but uh, sorry about that. <laughs> I mean, the, the, it w we were sort of just pondering to make a new set, and I kind of half-chokingly said that we should do the Red Room because it sort of is a place where um, it's not a real place, and it holds all these different narratives. Mm. And people just randomly turn up. And it's kind of quite surreal, so it seemed fitting for the occasion somehow. And it's iconic. I mean, who doesn't love the Red Room? <laughs> um, should we have a, a reading from the, the very, very beginning of the book? Yes. yes. I I thought, yes. We'll do, I'll do the, the bit, the very beginning, just when the magpie falls to earth. And the beginning of the story. Oh, good idea. Somewhere in southeast London, a flightless young magpie tumbles to the ground. From below, it's hard to make out exactly where it dropped from. Its nest could have been high up in one of the plane trees that line this lorry-worn road, a bush-like bower hidden behind a green veil of leaves. Or it might have been tucked away somewhere in the jumble of semi-disused warehouses that clutter the area an intricate formation of sticks and mud on corrugated iron and asbestos. Magpies construct their homes alongside ours, within sight but just out of reach, a magpie city superimposed on our own. It is a harsh and very human environment into which this bird has prematurely arrived. Cars with concertina bonnets and shattered windscreens wait in lines to be scrapped at the nearby junkyard. Fly-tipped fridges and sacks of rubble as immovable as boulders block the pavements. Puddles of spring rain shine purple with petrochemicals, and overhead, clouds of smoke and steam billow from the chimney of a huge waste disposal facility that incinerates rubbish around the clock. Juggernauts rumble past like thunderclouds and the football fans at Millwall FC roar. The only animals I've ever noticed here are pit bulls and rats, although a little further afield, around the dump, there are flocks of gulls and pigeons, along with a fleet of raptors sleek as fighter jets that are employed by the waste disposal company to chase the other birds away. My partner, Jana's workshop is just around the corner, in a leaky industrial unit on the edge of the junkyard. It's a part of the city that's full of secrets and surprises, but they're rarely cute and fluffy. A police raid on a neighbouring warehouse uncovers a cannabis farm one week, stolen motorbikes the next. A friend opens up a long abandoned shipping container and finds it crammed full of jet skis. Someone I once shared a prison cell with boasted of having dumped someone's sawn off limbs nearby. It's the last place on earth I would have expected something as yokey soft and bird bone brittle as a chick to turn up. The creature scuttles around in the gutter, lurching towards the curb like a drunk, staggering down an alleyway. Magpies leave home far too soon, long before they can really fly or properly fend for themselves. For weeks after they fledge their nests, they're dependent on their parents for sustenance, protection, and an education too. But this bird's parents are nowhere to be seen. They're not feeding it or watching it or guarding it. No alarm calls sound as a large apex predator approaches with footfalls made heavy by steel toe-capped boots. That doesn't mean its parents aren't nearby. It could be no accident that this bird is on the ground. If food was running short, a savage calculation may have been performed, showing that the only way to keep the family airborne was to jettison the runt. The bird has stopped moving now, 
It crouches down in the gutter, shivering from dehydration and perhaps fear too. If nature is allowed to run its course, it'll probably be dead before the day is out. The advancing human looms large as a tree trunk, sways uncertainly, and then, with a soft rustling, the bird's world goes dark. A couple of hundred miles to the west, and three decades distant in time, a young jackdaw tumbled from its nest in the steeple of a village church. Steely grey feathers, yellow beak, injured wing dragging along the floor. Jackdaws and magpies share family ties. The crow family, carrion kin. Someone stumbled across this injured bird, boxed it up and took it to the home of a local woman, an amateur animal healer. From there, the jackdaw found its way into the hands of the man who would go on to become my father. The magpie finds its way to me. Oh, well done. Very, very nice. So that's the beginning of that story, and I thought uh, perhaps we should have a little song now. Okay. We will sing a little song. Um, this song came to someone called Davy Dodds as he was driving in his car, and he gave someone a lift, an old woman a lift, and every time they passed a magpie, she would spit copiously in the well of the car. Um, and he thought, this is fascinating, and he thought he would write this song um, using a rhyme from uh, the 17th century, I think, one for sorrow. Um, and um, we have borrowed from um, our rather haunting version by The Unthanks. This is the mag. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> while, while you're finding it, I remember uh, the woman, the, the person that wrote this song, he picked up this old woman, and every time she saw a magpie, she'd spit on the floor and say, Devil, devil, I defy thee. Oh, yes. Yeah. But there are mag loads and loads devil, of magpie devil. traditions. I remember um, when I was at school, that we, if we saw a magpie, we had to hold our collar until we saw an ambulance, which I can always remember in things like hockey matches, everybody would be running around ho holding their collar, <laughs> hoping there's an ambulance. How often would you see an ambulance in Devon? Well, yeah, not that yeah. often. So in fact, you just were constantly holding your collar until you <laughs> forgot about it. <laughs> but there are loads of those. Mm. Loads of people have other magpie spotting things. There were seven on the lawn just yeah. tonight. <laughs> One for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl and four for a boy, five for silver, six for gold, seven's for a secret never told. Devil, devil, I defy. Devil, devil, I defy thee. Devil, devil, I defy thee. Oh, the magpie brings us tidings of news both fair and foul. She's more cunning than the raven, more wise than any owl. For she brings us news of the harvest, of the barley we dank. She knows when we'll go to our graves and how we shall mourn. One for sorrow, two for joy. We're wicked to worship the devil's bird Ah, but we respect the old ways And we disregard his word For we know they rest uneasy As we stumble in the night And we'll always leave a little bit of meat For the bird that 
Unforeseen. Yeah, nice chicken. Oh my god. Some unforeseen, completely foreseen circumstances. That was arose. lovely, thank you for that. <laughs> um, so we'll be doing a Q&A in a bit, as usual for those who are used to this, uh, whatever this is. Um, so get your questions in the comments if you have any questions about the book, about birds. Um, about me. Chickens, magpies, the crow family, anything like that. Um, and before that, I thought I'd do another reading in a bit, but the, there's a sort of, there's another story at the heart of this book. It's a book about birds and it's a book about fathers. And um, I've got one father here. Uh, David, who was kind enough to adopt me, thank you for that. The other one couldn't make it. The other one couldn't make it because he's sadly dead. Um, but my my biological father was this. Uh, I think of him as a magician because in my experience of him, he was always doing magic tricks. But he was more than that, really, I, wasn't he? I think of him as a as a writer primarily. Actually, probably. Um, I mean, when I knew him, he was a poet who had written plays. But then, you know, he did other things also. Um, so it was hard to see him as any one thing. Um, but you knew him through his, his right as a writer through, initially. I, I knew him as yeah. a writer, yes. Yeah. And he was this very sort of charming, charismatic man. And you two were sort of setting down roots and, and, and planning a future together. And then one night, when I was a baby, he just vanished in the dead of night. This is indeed the case. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It's kind of all right in your book, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. But without ex without any real explanation, he was gone. One one minute it was happy families, and then yeah, no, literally, you know. literally that that day. God, yeah. you're making me talk about it. That day, um, it, it's it's sort of etched Squish. in my head because he, he said this very odd thing of this is more than I deserve, which at the time, because given that it was a sort of really sort of candle lit kind of <laughs> moment, yeah, I thought, oh, head. that's a sort of what a lovely thing to say, and then later it started to sort of haunt me, and mm. I started thinking, God, actually there is a sort of double entendre there, yeah. and was that, you know, and he was a writer, so was that intended? Yeah. And, you know, it was a sort of thing that I came to replay yeah. many, many times. Yeah. And because he never explained why he disappeared, both of us, and you probably more than me, were having to look back at these signs, trying to find meaning in clues that may or may not have been given. Yes. Um, I mean, for much of my life, I've been, um, in some sense, guided by the lack of explanation of, you know, yeah. why does a father disappear? Why did my biological father yeah. disappear? And that question is sort of at the heart of this yeah. uh, book. I suppose I put it in fiction. Because yeah. I wrote a novel about someone whose father disappeared. Yeah. And I guess that I dealt with it in that way, in some way, if writing fiction does that, I don't know what it mm. does, but maybe. Yeah. It occurred to me the other day that that is quite odd, that in that book the um, person finds their father through looking at their father's things, which yeah. is something that uh, happened to you. Yeah. Um, um, so prophetic of me. Yeah. And, uh, and that for me was what was sort of perplexing when I found out about you know, I had this magpie, and, and raising a magpie is in many ways like raising a baby. They scream, they shit everywhere, cover your ears, Alinka. Um, you know, they need to be fed every 20 minutes. And then I found out that he had this jackdaw, and a jackdaw would be much the same. You know, very demanding, very high maintenance. And this was a man who, you know, wasn't able to look after his child, really. So it was, it was perplexing to me. And, and that mystery is also in this book. Um, but towards the end of his life, 
you know, we 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 had a sort of um, uh, re-engagement uh, over his deathbed, really, um, and it was ultimately frustrating. And I didn't really get the answers I wanted from him until after he was dead, and, and he left behind this enormous treasure trove of, of letters and diaries and journals. And I sort of had the very strange experience of getting to know my biological father after he was dead and finally understanding, I think, understanding why he did the things that he did. And we were going to have a Q&A shortly and um, another song, but before that I just wanted to do another... Be quiet, Has please, chickens. Respect. Is that hen dog? Um, it might be egg it's dog, not egg yeah. dog it's... No, egg dog makes that noise. I wanted yeah. to do another reading from the book, sort of on that theme. Um... So, egg dog, be quiet. No, I'm just gonna. Before that, I'm just gonna sort out these chickens. <laughs> Why don't Good I luck. sort out the chickens, Charlie? <laughs> I've sorted them. How did you think you're making them quiet? Just shush, chickens. We're doing a reading right now. Shall I give them some worms? Uh, that'll make them just make them that'll louder. Make them oh, actually, maybe give that one some worms. Why don't they? Should be Eugenia. Go, go some worms over the back. <laughs> Away from the mics. Here, you do. <laughs> oh, God. Here, you do. How are we this bad? Suzanne. <laughs> oh, my God. What? <laughs> 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 they're just very difficult guests. Never work with children. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why are the chickens so badly brought up? <laughs> uh, Alright. Uh, so this is, this is a bit from when uh, Heathcote was, was ill. <clears throat> On Father's Day morning, Lily calls to tell me that Heathcote has taken a serious turn for the worse. His lungs are filling with fluid and he's been slipping in and out of consciousness. She and China are getting there as soon as they possibly can. I should do whatever I want, she says. No pressure. But the doctors are saying that anyone who wants to see him shouldn't leave it until tomorrow. I bite my lip. I had planned to drive to the farm and spend the day with my dad, but now I'm torn. Haven't you done enough? Jana says. It's not like he'd be rushing to your bedside if you were dying. If you had had a relationship, then it'd be different. But it's not like there are lots of happy memories you can comfort him with. Unless you feel like you really need to be there to watch his soul escaping his body. Jana's words are harsh. She can be unforgiving when it comes to fathers, but I have to admit that she's right. I can't see what I have to give. On the farm, my parents are sitting out back in the shade of an old oak tree. My dad has a pair of binoculars pressed to his eyes and is watching a heron as it flies into a patch of wild bog land. The paddock in front of us is speckled with jackdaws and magpies. A buzzard circles silently above, waiting for food to run from the long grass. Setting the binoculars on the lawn, my dad opens the card I've brought him. Number one dad shouts its golden embossed design. He snorts and raises an eyebrow. I still worry about him getting jealous of number two, especially on days like today when he is so very present. My mum, even after everything, starts worrying on Hethcote's behalf. Are they giving him anti-anxiety medication, she asks. He suffers from such severe anxiety. Tell him to give them some if they're they're not. I check my phone compulsively throughout lunch, barely noticing the Sunday roast my dad puts down in front of us. Lily had promised to call if anything happens, but my phone sits unmoving in my palm. I scroll through Instagram blankly, staring at pictures of other people's father's days, while I wait for the news of Hethcote's death. Eventually, Jana takes the device out of my hands and leads me down to the river, where carp are sunbathing lazily by the water lilies. She strips off and jumps in with a yelp as the cold hits her. The carp scatter. I follow slowly, lowering myself inch by inch into the golden brown water, until my eyes are just above the surface. I think only about what is right in front of me a wasp-like hoverfly sitting fat and lazy on a swaying reed, azure damselflies falling like petals onto stems that protrude from the river, the tips of their wings dip-dyed with dark India ink, 
a dragonfly as meaty as a chinook beating its double wings as it hunts downstream. I ripple through the water, a living body unburdened by thought. Hethcote doesn't die that day. He regains consciousness. He even starts working on his poems again. If he just manages to eat something and starts getting his strength back, he may even be able to go home. The doctor's death sentence, a year to live, is starting to look like a goal to aim for. The next weekend, Lily calls again. The doctors are saying it's now or never. The finality of this breaks my resolve, and in the evening, with Yana in the passenger seat beside me, I drive to the hospital in Oxford for the very last time. Hethgut is hooked up to a breathing machine as noisy as an extractor fan. Sorry I miss Father's Day, I say to the old man on the bed. He cackles toothlessly through his transparent mask. Will the chickens be quiet, please? This is quite That's an emotional Eugenia. moment. I sit down and give Hethgut's cold hand a squeeze. He looks up at me and squeezes my hand back. China tries to remind him of the happy times they've had together. She conjures up a memory of a magic show he put on for her eighth birthday. China's kids remember him transforming feathers and glue into fudge. Lily doesn't say much, and I, of course, have nothing to add. I get a sad feeling that the stock of happy memories is a bit of a shallow barrel. Before long, China has to take the kids to bed, leaving just Lily, Yana and me on the sleepy ward. Hethcote gestures for his mask to be removed. I... 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 he says... What are you trying to say, Dad? Lily asks. Are you trying to say, I love you? Hethcote narrows his eyes. With all the force his collapsing lungs can muster, he wills the words out of his mouth. I, I, I scream, he hisses. Lily looks momentarily distraught. Then her face hardens. It's all he cares about now, she tells me. Mango ice cream. She flags down a nurse, who goes off to fetch him one from the staff fridge. The nurse returns with an ice cream which she hands to Yana. Hethcote leers at her greedily and chomps his gums. Yana looks a little uncomfortable. She and Hethcote have only met once, very briefly. They're definitely not on hand-feeding terms. But Hethcote's wishes are clear. Yana holds the lolly uncertainly to his toothless maw, and he laps it up slurping and sucking away without a hint of embarrassment. In fact, as he licks his way down to the wet wood of the stick, he looks up at Yana, to him basically a beautiful stranger, with a degree of pleasure that is quite unseemly, a rather entitled baby bird, and more than a little seedy. <laughs> so that's that. <laughs> So it's, it, it, there are moments of, uh, it's not just a light-hearted book about, you know, a magpie that comes to stay. It's a pretty uh, intense book, and it was extremely intense to write. Um, very, 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 very difficult book to write. But, it, but uh, towards the end, you know, it does achieve understanding and forgiveness, and I hope that readers get taken on the so, same emotional arc as me, because uh, writing this book... Um, has just, I mean, as well as it being wonderful to have a book written, it's just been such a psychologically important thing for me as well. Um, but I was thinking maybe we could have a Q&A <laughs> session now. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Goody. Yeah. So any questions, do send them in. Um, I hope that wasn't a downer, that bit. No. <laughs> Tell it's us just joke, real life. Like. I did. I had. I have got a question um, asking for everyone's favourite bird joke. Actually, anyone got any bird oh, jokes? Uh, Not the one about the chicken crossing the road. No, actually, no. the chicken crossing the road. To get joke, to the other side. Uh, yes. Does everyone except for me know that was about death? death? Does it? Have I only just got no, that I joke? Think the internet, I that. think the internet only just noticed that. Yeah. Um, Maybe the internet made it up. Um, bird. Bird joke. Bird, bird joke. joke. Um, no, no bird jokes. No, no, no bird jokes. Sorry. Um, not currently. Just all right. Well, we'll have we'll have just run through a few questions that have come in. Um, uh, your mum says, Charlie, why didn't you write a special chapter about me? What would be in a chapter about your mum? My mum. Yeah. Her job. 
Oh, Pleasure yeah. to do that anymore. <laughs> um, what would be about my mum? Uh, Not particularly to the point. But no. <laughs> her need for attention. Okay, I hope you're watching. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> hi Irina. Um, Richard drawings. Uh, maybe some. Maybe it's weird for me to be asking questions of myself. Shall no, shall no, it's fine. Is it weird? No, Richard drawings. Talk. Okay. Can, can you do an audio version like Polly did? I think your voice would be so great. Well, we have done an audio vo version. It's available to buy. Thank you, Daddy, for being the sound engineer. Oh, and um, he's got on a very that, old orange, from orange. Um, uh, Richard Drawings also asks if you could be any species of bird, what would you be? Anyone got any? Romany? I would be the harpy eagle. Ooh, what's a harpy eagle? It's like, it looks a bit like a freak of an owl, but massive, and it's just, you're not going to mess with it. It has its life sorted out, mm. it, it knows exactly what it wants from life. Mm. Nobody's going to, nobody's going to be intimidating it. Yeah. I would want to be a bird um, that can swim as well as fly, mm. I think, and, and you know, waddle. Um, so possibly a goose or a swan or a duck of some sort. I think it'd be nice to be able to do all the things. We've got a, a, a j bird joke that's coming. Why do, why, do, why do birds fly to hot climates in winter? Um. Because it's easier than walking. <laughs> Thank you for that, yeah. uh, Chris Salmon. That's very... very <laughs> <Is> that <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Chris Salmon. Oh, um, a liquor approved. Yay. Um, uh, can you... Do you mind? I'll put you upside down. Uh, we've got a lot of questions. Oh, Mistreated Skies. Was Polly a big influence for you and how did you realise you wanted to write the book? Um, you were an enormous inspiration, actually, uh, both stylistically you know, in terms of um, the sort of beauty of your descriptions. I mean, oh, yeah, you're a very, very beautiful and talented writer in that. And, and seeing your focus as well, actually, and, and all of your advice, actually, throughout. You're so good with, you know, how, you. how to write. I mean, it's been amazing writing as well, having a professional and critically acclaimed best-selling writer on hand. <laughs> and an FRSL. <laughs> Um, as, just, yeah. Yeah. Um, as for how Someone I... Someone on Facebook actually, Amanda Craig, just put, I put a thing saying, I think to you, the piece you wrote in The Observer, and she just put underneath, um, oh, hard luck having a, another writer in the family. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> well, I kind of know. Um, yeah. It's, 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 yeah, I can see that. It's not so bad. Yes, what, what is the same when a writer is born, the family dies, but what if they're about, you know, one, two, three, four, five, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the age of everyone sh oversharing on everything, I yeah. guess it's fine. Yeah. Um, what, let's see what other questions are coming in. Um, we've got some questions about April Baby 1960 says, Three ravens come to my tree each time I am near and squawk loudly at me. What do you think that means? Worms. I think it either means that you're uh, about to be crowned Queen of Ravens, or possibly they just want you to feed them? I'm not sure, but maybe feeding will help you become Queen of Ravens. Um, lots of questions about what does it mean when crows croak. Uh, your guess is honestly as good as mine. What we do know is that they are saying something. Uh, we just haven't quite decoded crow yet. Um, Eugenia! Egg yeah. dog. No, it's Eugenia. I see her mouth moving. I saw egg dog. She's a weird prehistoric little freak. He. Much love. Uh, Linda Oasis. How long did it take you to write Featherhood? Too long, <laughs> really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you yes. did have a baby and uh, yeah. everything. In, in the pr and your father, you know, and your yeah. father died. And yeah. I mean, you, you, was, you were writing a book, as far as I remember, mm. you were writing a book that was really much more about um, benzene. Yeah. And then all these things happened, like yeah. having a baby and your father dying, sort of, yeah. all and kind of, and so they just became integrated, yeah. I think, as far as I remember. Yeah, no, it was. It, it did start out as just, you know, I'm going to write a book yes. about this bird and sort of bring some things from my own life, you know, what my time in prison and, and captivity and things, and then, yeah, baby, yeah. father dying. Is that like Siblington? That's Siblington, yeah. Hello, Siblington. 
Such a delightful oh. creature. So it's been, a, it's been very, it's sort of evolved from me all the time. Before. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know how you found the time to write it. We've got another joke that's come in from Paul Martin. Thank you, Paul. Paul jokes. What do you give a sick bird? A tweetment. <laughs> Lots of people are asking for the chicken's names. Uh, who wants to name the chicken? This is Egg Pup. That's Egg Siblington on his foot. This is um, Jane. And Suzanne. That's Suzanne, that dark grey one there. And then the ones making all the noise, the Eugenias. Yeah, the pesky Eugenias who are There are a hundred other chickens refusing to come into the shop. Yeah. Uh, Brittany D86. How does it feel to pour your heart out into something you know a lot of people will soon read? Um, initially extremely difficult. I mean, there have been moments where I've wondered... I mean, while writing it, I just couldn't be thinking that people would read it. Yeah. I just had to completely seal myself off from that thought. Otherwise, I could not have written it. And then once I'd written it, I thought, Jesus Christ, what the hell have I done? Why have I done this? Because it is... It, what, writing it was like performing open-heart surgery on myself. And publishing it is like just ripping the heart out and just putting it on the sort of butcher's scales. Yeah. Um, but now I'm actually, I think because I've processed all the things that sit in the book, <laughs> uh, I'm ready for people to read it because they don't really hold power over me in the same way. No. It, but it's also, I mean, because you've been mangled through the media and your privacy in some ways so were taken away from you without yeah. your consent. Mm. So I think... I mean, I personally felt also about like my private life being in this was um, that it was quite positive because it sort of gave you control over that as well yes. somehow mm. the control over your own story, yeah. a story that has just been put out there and people just sort of ascribe things to you. <laughs> the chickens, yeah, I agree. Are, the, the chickens <laughs> are sort of swarming on me. I'm going to do a picture of that. Um, so should we have? Another song? Anyone got anything they want to say? Should we have a, another tune? Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> okay. Anyone want to take a view? Just have a tune. So, um... Oh yeah, do you want me to move? Uh, no, it's fine. It's fine. We're going to sing a song by a guy called Eden Arbez, who, um... No, no, <laughs> get off there. Sit <laughs> no! What's she doing? <laughs> Is the live still going? Yeah, I think that is it. I hope it is. Game. Anyway, Eden Arbez was, was born in New York in 1908. He was sent with his twin sister um, to an orphanage for six or seven years, and then he was adopted by a family in Kansas. Um, he then moved to Los Angeles um, before, about the beginning of the Second World War, I think, where he became a, a sort of proto-hippie following um, a German movement of the early part of the century which was um, then suppressed by Hitler in favour of the uh, Hitler Jugend and it was called, strangely enough Charlie, it was called the Wondervogel oh, which is oh, the wonder, yeah. wonder wandering birds. bird oh. no, really? yeah. this movement, anyway he was a true true hippie um, and he lived in a sort of knocked together a little camp with his wife and small baby under the L, the first L, of the Hollywood sign in Griffith Park. Um, where, and he won, went out by bicycle from there and uh, went to various cafes and restaurants and played piano, uh, mostly in vegetarian places because he was um, a devout vegetarian and... Anyway, he wrote this song, and he wanted Nat King Cole to sing it, who was then not Nat King Cole, as we know him later. He was the King Cole Trio. And he went to try to get in backstage at one of his concerts and to give him this song. Um, he was turned away. They didn't want it. But somehow he managed to give it to his valet, and his valet, I think was also a musician and read the sheet music and hummed it a bit and uh, Nat King Cole was taken with it and got to play it and he played it constantly at all his concerts 
and people loved it. So he wanted to uh, record it, but um, Eden Arbez had not left his name written on the paper or his address or yeah. anything. So they couldn't record it without having um, his details. Anyway, a bit of detective work found him under the L of the Hollywood sign, and um, history was made. Anyway, Nat King Cole. Lived under the Hollywood L of the Hollywood sign. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Literally underneath. Like yeah. Under the L was sheltering him. Yeah. yeah. And what's the song about? And the song is about um, Nature Boy. It's about his sort of lifestyle, yeah. hippie lifestyle. Oh, good. That's good. Um, the song is a lot shorter than all, <laughs> all this exposition. Anyway, the poor old guy went everywhere by bike. But somehow, when he was 86, he went in a car and had a car crash and got oh, killed. Oh, stop it. Poor old Dan. Eden. We won't dance. give you the rest of the down. Okay, anyway. There was a boy A very strange, enchanted boy They say he wandered very far Very far shy and sad of eye but very wise was he and then one day a magic day he passed my way and while we spoke of many things fools and said to me the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return lovely thank you well let's wrap that up thank you everybody for coming I hope you enjoyed that um, I hope it was not too intense a reading to <laughs> choose yeah, I think it was... from um, uh, uh, a few questions about where people Mama. in other countries can get it it's coming out on audiobook in English and um, a, a lovely bookshop called Newham Bookshop for shipping internationally and uh, we've also done some, we've all, you, you and me and Daddy have done some special signed pictures for an a organisation called the Magpie Project, um, which helps mothers with young children in need. And if you go to the Magpie Project, um, you can bid for these. They also come with a signed book. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's wonderful to be able to support them. And uh, we hope that uh, 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 some people watching will. So thank you everyone so so much for coming and should we do this again sometime? We could I mean we've got this set, so Oh well, we better use it again one yeah. day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Never one off. Uh, yeah. Well wonderful. Thank you well, everyone and thank and you everyone here for taking the time. Here's to Featherhood. Yeah. yeah. Here's to yeah. Featherhood. Here's my cup of worms. <laughs> to yeah. Featherhood. Oh is that a glass of worms? Chin -chin. Yes, that's Here's nice. a glass of worms. So. <laughs> thank you everyone. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. Thank you, thank bye you. Bye. Go home. It's over. <laughs>